Pope Francis is the first Jesuit to command the Catholic Church's highest office. In a meeting in 2014 with then-Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, an interesting exchange took place regarding which language was allegedly spoken by Jesus Christ. To gain a deeper insight into the linguistic history of the ancient Middle East, one must consider events that took place during the beginning of the Bronze Age, when the Middle East, Levant, and Mediterranean were dominated by the Amorites, who would go on to establish Babylon, which was raised from a small town to an independent and influential city-state. Almost all of the local kings in Babylonia, such as Hammurabi, belonged to this Amorite stock. In the Bible, they are described as a powerful people of great strength and stature, quote, like the height of the cedars, which led some Christian scholars to refer to the Amorites as giants. In Deuteronomy, the Amorite king, Og, was described as the last of the remnant of the Rephaim, an ancient race of giants. And the earliest Sumerian sources concerning the Amorites Beginning around 2400 BC, the land of the Amorites was located with the lands to the west of the Euphrates, including Canaan or Phoenicia, and what was to become Syria by the 3rd century BC, where Ugarit was located. Discovered by accident in 1928, Ugarit was an ancient port city in northern Syria, laying in a large artificial mound in the Mediterranean coast which flourished from around 4,000 years ago until its destruction in 1185 BC, probably at the hands of the Sea People, who I covered in a prior video and will leave a link to in the description. The kingdom would be one of many dismantled during the Bronze Age collapse, but leaving behind a brief glimpse into the ancient history with the Ugaritic texts. These ancient cuneiform tablets were written in the 13th century BC, and inscribed in Uruitic, an otherwise unknown Northwest Semitic language, considered the only existing remnant of the Amorite language. The most famous of the Ugarit texts are approximately 50 epic poems, as well as 150 tablets describing the Ugaritic cult and its magic rituals. The three major literary texts are the Legend of Keret, the Tale of Agat, and the Baal cycle, also known as the Epic of Baal, which is about the Canaanite god Baal, which means lord or owner, and refers to an ancient storm god associated with sex, rain, and fertility. The text identifies Baal as the god Hadad, introduced to Mesopotamia by the Amorites, where he became known as the Akkadian or Assyrian Babylonian god Adad, he appeared bearded, often holding a club or thunderbolt, while wearing a bull-horned headdress as the sun was in Taurus in the old Babylonian period around the second millennium BC. Hadad was equated with the Hittite storm god Teshub, the Greek god Zeus, and the Roman god Jupiter. In ancient Egypt, he was Amun, which was combined with Ra, the sun, to make Amun-Ra, Depicted as a ram during the age of Aries, as any god associated with Jupiter's 12-year orbit along the ecliptic all stem from the ancient Atlantean solar religion of the Pleistocene, which kept track of the 25,920-year procession of the equinox. Unique among the Ugarit texts are the earliest known lists of letters in alphabetic cuneiform, the traditional names for the letters of the Phoenician alphabet. Other tablets found in the same location were written in other cuneiform languages, 
Sumerian, Hurrian, and Akkadian, as well as the Egyptian and Luwian hieroglyphs, and Crypto-Minoan, which is the pre-Greek language of ancient Crete. The Amorites are also mentioned in the Bible as inhabitants of Canaan both before and after the conquest of the land under Joshua, meaning the time of Moses and the Exodus, and the term Amuru in Akkadian and Sumerian texts refer to the Amorites, their principal deity, and the Amorite kingdom, known as the land of Amuru, and later as Aram, which is where we get the name of the Mesopotamian language called Aramaic, which was widely spoken in Mesopotamia and among the earliest languages to be written down. That said, Aramaic would certainly have been known to Jesus, assuming he existed as it was used in everyday life, so the Pope is correct in a sense. However, Jesus was not only allegedly circumcised on the eighth day after his birth, but was also referred to as Rabbi in the biblical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and John, so would also surely be familiar with Hebrew, as it was in Luke, Jesus was shown reading Hebrew at a synagogue. So Netanyahu would also be correct in his assertion, as Hebrew was used in a religious and ritualistic context. Aramaic and Hebrew are both Semitic languages, a term that comes from the biblical Sem, the oldest son of Noah, and pertains to a linguistic group, not a race. The term Aryan in modern times is interchangeable with the Indo-European languages, but in antiquity, and in mystery school religions describe the ancient nobility of the Holocene, stretching back to before the Bronze Age. The term Aryan was etched in 2,500-year-old cuneiform in Iran by Darius the Great, who claimed that he and his ancestral lineage came from the, quote, Aryan race. Rudolf Steiner also used the term Aryan to describe the Aryans as descendants of the Atlanteans, who went on to establish the early civilizations of the Holocene, which was also mirrored by the American congressman Ignatius Donnelly, who in 1882 authored the book Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. Madame Blavatsky, the foundress of Theosophy, referred to all people of the Holocene, meaning our current geological age, as being, to various degrees, part of the Aryan root race, or fifth root race, which stems from the prior Atlantean root race, or fourth root race. Which brings us to the academic theories of the Ananerbe, the German Ancestral Research Society, which, except for one member, was found not guilty of any war crimes during the Nuremberg trials, with every scientist and archaeologist going on to become esteemed professors at universities around the world following World War II. According to their pre-war findings, Jesus Christ was a descendant of the Aryan Amorites, which was also mirrored by Houston Stuart Chamberlain, a British philosopher who claimed that King David and Jesus were both Aryans of Amorite extraction. So while the Amorites are described as being a Semitic-speaking people, the term Semitic refers to a language group, not a race, as in antiquity, the old world was divided into three segments, symbolically represented by the three sons of Noah, all stemming from the Caucasus region, which is where we get the term Caucasian from. That said, an article published in the peer-reviewed journal Nature Communications claims that blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned settlers invaded and inhabited the Levant some 6,500 years ago, according to DNA studies, solving the mystery of how the Chalcolithic culture got to Galilee, which is another way of saying the Copper Age. Quote, Scientists have discovered that waves of migration from Anatolia and the Zagros Mountains to the Levant helped develop the Chalcolithic culture that existed in Israel's Upper Galilee region some 6,500 years ago. Certain genetic characteristics, such as blue eye color, were not seen in the DNA test results of earlier Levantine human remains. While the terms Nordic Aryan and Semitic might seem to be in conflict to some, 
the Amorites were regarded as nomadic pastoralists, meaning they moved around to let their herds graze, consisting of various domesticated animals, such as horses and cattle. After several millennia, this Middle Eastern or Eurasian demographic that domesticated cattle and drank its milk adapted the ability to drink milk as an adult, meaning they became genetically lactose tolerant and many migrated into Europe. Northern Europeans are among the most lactose tolerant people in the world as their ancestry is descended from Aryan tribes that introduced domesticated horses and cattle into Europe, as well as blue eyes, which during the Holocene can be traced to one Eurasian tribe originating around the Caucasus Mountains, where we get the term Caucasian from. In prior videos, I've already discussed how Icelandic sagas, as put forth by Snorri Sturluson, backed by archaeological research performed by Thor Heyerdahl, place the origins of the Odin story in Eurasia, claiming that the origin of the Norse royal dynasties and pre-Christian Norse gods entered Europe from the Caucasus, emigrating from the Black Sea region through the area or city called Azov around the river Don into Scandinavia. The ancient Amorite god associated with pastoralism was known in Sumerian as Martu, but the name used by the Amorites was Amuru, developing into a major deity in Babylon. An association between Amuru and the steppes is well attested, as he was also referred to as Lord of the Steppes, but also Lord of the Mountains. Amuru's main attribute was the Gamlu, a type of crooked staff used by shepherds, depicted on ancient cylinder seals, as well as depictions of pharaohs and other gods and deities, including Jesus. Amuru's father was the sky god Anu, and the name Amuru could refer to both the god and to the people themselves. In other words, they did not call themselves Canaanites or Phoenicians, they called themselves Amuru, which designated part of Syria and all of Phoenicia and Palestine. Incidentally, similar to the name of the double-headed winged serpent god of Peru called Amaru, and their territory was known as Amaruka. Speaking of America, just how did it get that name anyway? Officially, America is named after the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, but this appears doubtful, like so much of American history which has transformed a one-time pirate of the family name Griego into an iconic hero named Christopher Columbus. As for America, according to Manly Hall, America is named after the Plumed Serpent, who is the messenger of the sun. He was the god Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, and in Peru he was called Amaru. From the latter name comes our word America. Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumed serpent as this plumed serpent was a messenger of the sun he was also a light bearer light bearer is the literal translation for the word lucifer in latin the official language of the roman empire that decimated the phoenician civilization during the punic wars and then vilified their gods as devils before appropriating much of the same solar religion under a layer of Catholic veneer. Of course, after the fall of the Roman Empire, this genocide was continued by the Church's Inquisition, which targeted Gnostics, Templars, and witches. The term Wicca literally means wise ones, as they were in actuality the sages of the old Aryan religion, which not only faced genocide in Europe, but also in the Americas. We are told that the New World symbols have nothing to do with the same symbolism revered in the Old World and that there was no transatlantic contact before Columbus. But looking at a map of Haplogroup X, which stretches back into the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, we could see a strong, direct link between the New World and, in particular, Phoenicia, or Amuru. This genetic link is reinforced 
when one considers the Mesoamerican legends of giants, bearded Caucasian inhabitants, Solutrian stone tool technology, and parallels in mythology. I've discussed in prior videos that the large ancient mining operations in Michigan produced huge quantities of copper which could not be accounted for in known Native American artifacts, implying that it was used to fuel the Bronze Age in the Old World by the Phoenician transatlantic merchants. That said, copper was not the only metal brought back to the Levant from the Americas, but also large quantities of gold were also hoarded and buried in Jerusalem, giving rise to the legends of Solomon's gold and part of the treasures that inspired the Templar Crusades into the Holy Land to retrieve the vast treasure. According to the Bible, King Solomon received a cargo every three years, which consisted of gold, silver, and other valuables from Ophir, which was famous for its wealth. The theologian Benito Arias Montano in 1571 proposed finding Ophir in the name of Peru, reasoning that the native Peruvians were thus descendants of Ophir and Shem. This is a map of Montano's Sacra Geographia, available in the Department of Rare Books and Special Collections at the Princeton University Library, showing the distribution of the descendants of the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In the key at the bottom left, you will notice a red arrow pointing to the word Ophir next to the number 19. There's another red arrow above it pointing at the number 19 in what is modern day Peru, signifying the location of Ophir. This knowledge was known to the Templars. It is common knowledge in secret society organizations that the Knights Templar were custodians of the ancient secrets of Mesopotamia as attested to by the archaeologists of the German Ananerbe, which pursued the occult legacy of their perceived noble ancestors all over the world, which may have also included some famous American historical figures as well. A surprise discovery. A time capsule found last week buried more than 130 years beneath the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee was opened in Richmond, Virginia. It wasn't that it wasn't meant to be found. It wasn't meant to be found easily. Crews uncovered it while working to remove the pedestal where the Lee statue, long seen as a symbol of racial injustice, had stood until its removal in September. It was taken down following protests over racism and police brutality. Inside the capsule were three books, including an almanac from 1875, a cloth envelope, a pamphlet, and a silver coin. I think it's part of the mystery of maybe the lost cause. What were they thinking back then? Records from the Library of Virginia indicated around 60 items would be found inside, and a newspaper article from that time period suggested the capsule contained Civil War artifacts and a picture of Lincoln lying in his coffin. Instead, just those six items and the three books appeared to have suffered severe water damage. There were no open by dates uh, prior to the 1920s, 1930s. They put these time capsules in with the ex expectation that they would last in perpetuity. So it's, it's like, well, why would they do that? Virginia Governor Ralph Northam says it's an important day for the history of Richmond and Virginia, and that the books will shed light on what people were thinking in the late 19th century. While the mainstream media made the find seem mundane, I did happen to catch a segment as part of a two-hour PBS special of the unpacking and would like to show you some of the buried contents which CBS News failed to mention. Um, I think we're just going to... I don't know what I'm looking at yet. Um, I couldn't... I'm not sure I think it's bored with some kind of metal on it. There's one more shout I didn't give, and I should have, but Cindy Bailey, who's the governor's council here, and Jessica Colleen, who is here. If you all remember, the, taking down this monument was not without its legal challenges, and Rita Davis, who is Cindy's predecessor, uh, kind of led the way to, it's to make sure this It's a piece of card, I think. It's two pieces of card. Come on, 
Okay, well this is a thing. Um, it appears to have like a knight on it, maybe? Okay. Uh, J.H. Capers, Richmond Commandery Number Two, Knights Templar. Here's me a list of officers, knights, past commanders, honorary members. History is written by the winners, especially the historic events regarding the Civil War, the Two World Wars, and the Punic Wars, where Rome's victory and the subsequent destruction of the Phoenician city of Carthage marked the end of the Old World Order in the Mediterranean, and ushered in the dominance of Rome for several centuries, and then by extension, its continuance through the Catholic Church, which hardly resembles the original faith it claims to represent. The majority of the secret societies throughout history that were set up to uphold the true esoteric doctrines have long since been dismantled or have been infiltrated and covertly become instruments of the very menace they were set up to combat. That said, not all organizations have fallen and infiltration can go both ways. It does not just happen by one side. And with that, I will leave off with something by Rumi. Quote, If everything around seems dark, look again. You may be the light. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.